Welcome back to Storytellers. I am your host, John Hartness. I'm the founder and publisher of Falstaff Books, and this is where we go behind the book. We talk to authors about their new releases, their backlist books, and we kind of dive a little bit into where the book came from. And our guest today is Emily Lavin Leverett, and she'll be talking to us mostly about her new release, The Wolf in the Cloister. So, hi Emily, tell the world about yourself. Hi, I'm, um, first I was a medieval English professor, and then I was an editor, and then I was a writer, and now I'm all three. But that was the order it happened. <laughs> so, being a medieval English professor, your whole life is built around old dead people. Yeah. So who is Marie de France and why are we writing sexy vampire stories about, sexy werewolf stories about her today? Because well, Marie de France is a late 12th century nun in England. Um, we know that there are three different people she could be. And so I got to pick the one I wanted to write about, but she wrote uh, short poems called Brett and Lays that are romances. And I've loved romances. That's the favorite thing I have in the Middle Ages. I teach them as often as possible. And they're just stories of knights and ladies and magic and all of the kind of things we think of that go with chivalry. And they really are sort of the grandparents to modern day romance novels. Okay. Um, and especially Marie de France, because she writes about women, and women are her main characters, and women's desire is actually a part of the story. A lot of the romances are very much men doing manly things, which is fine, but there's not a lot of interiority for the women, and so Marie de France gave interiority for both. So she had this weird concept that medieval women actually wanted agency and yeah wow and she was also remarkably well educated we know that she spoke french and english and um she writes in french and she had to have spoken or at least read and written in latin because she was eventually an abbess um so running an abbey so she was really super well educated which probably means that she came from a super important family. Um, and one of the theories, and it's the theory that I've taken from the novel, is that she is the bastard sister of Henry II, um, okay. of the king. And so that would make total sense for her to have been sort of politically tucked away in an abbey, um, which was a pretty powerful position, actually. Um, she is living in England. She is writing in England, which is why a French woman writing in French is considered an English author. Okay. Now, for me, most of what I know about the medieval period comes from various books and movies. Mm -hmm. So, from what I've seen in popular culture, it wasn't uncommon for the second, third, or illegitimate sons to be shipped off to the priesthood. Yeah, two choices, the military or the priesthood. Right. Um, you know, yeah. you got an heir, you got an heir and a spare, and then you send the rest off to be whatever. Yeah. I mean, often the bastard children of the church would be sent into the church. So, well, that makes sense. You know, you, you know, it came from everywhere. Okay. So tell us a little bit about this story. What where are we? What's going on? I have read this first one. I haven't read, yeah, I've read about half of the second one. I don't edit everything we produce at Falstaff because God knows no human being could edit all of that. So I haven't read everything we've produced, but I have read the first one and I really liked it. I thought it was a fun stylistic blend of a period book and with contemporary urban fantasy pacing. That's what I tried for. Um, it definitely is a period book which is both a lot of fun and a gigantic pain in the ass. 
I'm not a huge fan of suddenly having to stop writing because I've got to go on a deep dive on whether or not this person could be wearing a belt. Um, my editor, Lucy Blue, who's the editor of the Falstaff Crush line, she um, had to tell me that they didn't have matches back then, that they didn't have matches until the 1800s. So really? she couldn't be carrying matches with her. And she either had to have a torch or go in the dark. I took the dark because I had no idea that matches were. I, yeah, I, it's something I probably should have known. She would have had to have a flint with her, which was not particularly usual. Um, so that and so not quick. Well, and it's historical novels are prone to correction. Right. I work very, very hard to keep guns out of my writing because I know nothing about them. And I know that people who know about them get very upset when you get things wrong. Yep. So if I have a character with a weapon like that, they won't know how to use it and will either get lucky or unlucky. But and so some of that holds true with the Middle Ages stuff. There's a lot less we know. And so there's a lot more room. You know, and once you throw in magic to a certain extent, you can do what you want to do because it's magic. Right. Um, but I've been careful with her horse to make sure that her horse can do, because there's there's gun people, then there's horse people. Yeah, and they are equally adamant about yeah. what is and it is not capable. Yeah, and so I asked on Facebook and both medieval friends and fiction writers gave me pictures and links and all sorts of stuff. They explained that a hand is four inches. Because they're like, well, a horseman would have been 15 hands high. And I'm like, that means nothing to me. Right. And My when hand? they talk about that, what are they measure? They're measuring to the shoulder. Yes. Right? I yeah, they're not measuring to the top. Right. Yeah, so my protagonist has a great big horse, um, which is unusual for a nun, but she kept it from when she was a noble lady, mostly because it won't let anyone else near it without biting them. Um, so she got to keep it. Um, her horse is called Gringolet, which is the name of Sir Gowan's horse and Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Nice. But there's lots of that. My plots are loosely based on romances. Um, her own plot is based on one of her own romances. So oh, cool. she is um, and she is a nun in the Abbey. She is not an abbot yet. She's a nun in the Abbey because um, her marriage fell apart and she bowed out of the marriage to join the church so that he could marry this woman that he loved more than her. Um, and so She's a nun, and so a lot of people assume that, like so many, she has been a nun forever and never anything else. So, right, of but course. she's not quite as innocent as she looks. Oh, as the wimple would make you think. Right. Did they wear wimples then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and there are various different styles of wimples. Okay. And in fact, wimples were fashionable in court clothing too. That's right, because I've seen. I've seen paintings of noble women. Yeah. yeah. With just their little faces peeking out. The um the really great horrific bitchy woman character on Game of Thrones. Oh, Cersei? No. The, oh no 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 no. The other yes. The yeah. grandmother that was such a fantastic character. She had that look, I think. Right. Twice. Yeah, and it is in the Middle Ages, it is stereotypically old women or older women, right? Younger women tend to be wearing things that aren't covering much that they can get away with. It just depends. You know, there are a lot of things that you and I could get away with when we were younger that we don't wear today. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be one of my pieces of advice is wear what you want to wear when you're young enough to look good in it. Yeah. And people to go, oh, well, they're just young. Exactly. Because by the time, you're, by the time your beard or hair turn, gets this color, it's a lot more judgy if you run around and yeah. cut off jorts and no t-shirt. Yeah. Just saying. Just throwing yep. that out there. Um, 
So this is going to be a series of linked novellas yes. that will then be released in a hardback, paperback, and audiobook version. This book came out yesterday for where this, for when, because we're airing this in the future. <laughs> ew, ew. <laughs> um, so this book came out yesterday in ebook and paperback form. Mm -hmm. And the ebook is exclusive to Amazon, unless you're one of our Patreon patrons, in which case you got it early. So you can click on the link below and join our Patreon after you click on the link below and pick up your copy of The Wolf in the Cloister. Now, the second book is written and in edits. Sure. <laughs> I know the second book's it. Well, it's written, so. Yeah. And I Once think you've my editor in, it's in edits. Yeah. Just like the I'm third book of the Ice Pod Chronicles. It's, it's in edits. Right. So, yeah. the Ice Pod Chronicles is the other series that you're working on, and that's a series that you write with another author. Right. Sarah Joy happen? Adams. How'd that happen? Graduate school. Um, <laughs> Sarah and I went to graduate school. She is also a medievalist. She is also an English professor. Um, and that was where we met. And we came up with the idea for the book in a Latin class because we had a Latin exam and were very, very tired of reading Virgil. Um, and it happened to be book four of the Aeneid where guy offers a person a pretty little nymph for what she wants and for some reason it just made both of us laugh and so from there we started talking about the possibility of writing and our main character is an English professor and a medievalist who has to go to ferry to find her father because being half fae is killing her in the human world um, and so she's very unhappy to have to give up the tenure track position um, and so those books are very much a product in some ways that character of being in graduate school which is at the same time the most fun i've ever had because everybody around me thought the stuff that i thought was important was really important too okay right? and yeah. so almost never again will that happen except when i go to medieval conferences um and graduate school is also a nightmare it's emotionally and psychologically traumatic. Um, most people who go to graduate school have been told for a very long time they're very smart, and that stops when you walk in the door of graduate school. Um, and you know, funny enough, the same thing happens to undergraduate theater majors. Sure. Because yeah. you were the best actor in your high school until you got to your first audition in college. Yep, exactly. And so, it was remarkably stressful, um, but out of that came a lot of good stories and creativity, and we would turn to storytelling to find an outlet for all the stress. And okay. we, I think I actually said out loud, it can't be that hard to write a book. I mean, look at some of the crap out there. Surely we can do better than this. So don't ever say anything like that out loud. Um, <laughs> I think literally every published author has said that and lived long enough to regret it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, the, the whole adage of you should write a million words before you're, you know, ready. Or, um, I didn't believe it until I realized, because we started and restarted this book six times, that I probably was close to a million words by the time we got, along with everything else that I'd written. Um, yeah, I didn't believe it either until somebody pointed out to me that the 400 articles I'd written for journalism and the six years of daily blogging that I'd written added up to well over a million words. Yeah. I was like, uh, yeah, okay. So maybe yeah. I wasn't fully birthed with narrative voice. Right, exactly. And because we started, like, I'd never taken a creative writing class. I'd never studied anything at all. I'd done 
the literary magazine in high school and stuff like that. But I gave up writing after creative writing after high school. Um, and Sarah has much more of a background in creative writing classes and things like that than I did. But neither of us had written a novel before. So our first novel was learning how to write a novel. And we immediately knew and understood how to write a bad novel. Got, got right there on that level super fast. Um, so many but then, don't ever get, further, get any further than that. Right. Um, and so the persistence one learns in graduate school and the persistence in the face of everybody suggesting that you really are a lot dumber than you thought you were and you don't have a chance to do this, and why are you here anyway, or at least feeling like people are saying that. Going through that made going through writing a novel and rejections and stuff a little easier. Um, but it definitely did influence our character, who um, can be a bit defensive about what she knows and doesn't know, um, but is also pretty willing to defer to authority when she actually accepts that someone has authority in something. Um, which is, I found, true for a lot of academics. Like, I'm not going to lecture a mechanic on how to fix a car because I have no idea. So, an expert in a car, I'll listen to what they say, right? Like, they want to throw down about grammar, a different story, but... Yeah, you're probably not going to take a whole lot of notes from me talking to you about medieval English literature. Yeah. Don't. Luckily, the, my editor, um, Lucy, for the Wolf in the Clayster, um, studied medieval literature, as did the cover artist who has a master's in medieval literature. Yeah. So it all perfectly, exactly what. Oh, I'm know. certainly surrounded by people who are far better educated than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe more educated in terms of things like the job market and career success better. Yeah. About the same as a theater major. That's fair certainly about the same level of marketability. So the third book has been turned in. Yes. Your editor right. swears that it will get read at some point. I'm sure. I edit the Ice Pod Chronicles for those of you at home who don't know that because how the hell would you? So I'm looking forward to it. It's, um, let's, let's hold that thought for just a second. Because the first two books, Changeling's Fall and Winter's Air, are available right now. You yes. can get them in hardcover, paperback, and you can get both of, both of them in audio as well. So you can, and all, and ebook on Amazon. Mm -hmm. You can get print copies on falstaffbooks.com if you want to buy them directly from the publisher, or you can get them wherever books are sold that still delivering books right now. <laughs> yeah, you want to read it right now, the best bet is an ebook. Yes, because I ship slowly. I'll own it. it. Everything ships slowly right now. Yeah, author copies right now are, it usually takes about a week to 10 days to get author copies delivered. It's running about three weeks right now. Yeah. But, you know, we don't have any cons to sell them at. I looked at my bookcases about maybe Monday of this week, and I said, oh, well, I'm out of some things. I should reorder to make sure I've got enough for, oh, well, never mind. Yep. Because right now we don't know when the next convention will have is the only the next one that's currently on the books is con carolinas but who knows yeah if they follow the governor's guidelines for opening back up the state con carolinas won't happen though they may be able to successfully move it online which would be awesome yeah well they've actually already said that whether the convention happens in physical space or right. not they are adding some online components to the convention from here on out. Yeah, I think that's super smart. I do too, because it allows, well, one, it's an evergreen piece of marketing that will always live out there and people can 
go out and say, oh yeah, that Con Carolinas panel was awesome. I watched it online and I want to go to that convention. There are Dragon Con panels of mine that are online from the first year I was there. Oh, wow. Yeah. There's in some poor sap has sat there and held their phone from like five rows back videotaping several of the big ballroom panels I was on. It's like, yeah, God bless you. And I totally do that. I'm not surprised that Dragon Con was sort of an early adopter of let's put all this stuff online. Yeah. So other than the Wolf in the Cloister, what else are you working on? We've always got. I, yeah, I do. I am um, actually speaking of AJ Hartley, right? Um, I've got an article in his academic book that should be out this summer. Um, awesome. It's called Geek Shakespeare. And it's all about the ways that Shakespeare gets used in popular culture. Um, I, he talks some actually about like conventions and, and the broader sort of science fiction and fantasy community. Um, but I specifically talk about the way that the character William Shakespeare's used in The Sandman okay. um, by Neil Gaiman. So that's going to be, I've read about half of the essays and it is really great. Um, he is editing it with um, Peter Holland, who is another yeah. huge name in Shakespeare. So, yeah. Um, AJ kind of knows I'm, all those guys working on an article for another collection on being a medievalist who writes fiction and how those two interact. Um, and it's actually gonna be a whole collection of essays about that written by scholars who look at the fiction, like medievalists who look at contemporary fiction, medievalists who write the fiction, um, and then some writers who write it but are not academics as well. Um, so some interesting perspectives on that. That sounds really and, interesting. Yeah. Um, like, to me, who's completely not an academic. It is, yeah, it is. If, if you're interested at all, because the Middle Ages in terms of scholars is, it's not unusual to find fiction writers coming out of that. Um, there are lots and lots of very popular series that are written by um, academics of some sort or another from the Middle Ages. Um, I admit, romance is not often one of them, and so... Um, we decided to use Emily Leverett to separate this from Lavin Leverett, which is what my scholarship and the other books are under, because it's totally great if someone finds my scholarship from my romance, but it may not oh. work in my favor to slide the other direction immediately. It's not yeah. quite I write erotica in children's books, but you know, it's, no, it's that's, not um, bad. That's probably smart just because there's like you said, people going from one to the other, it's like if you were it's if you were to write adult fiction and YA, if you start with the adult fiction and then you happen to read the YA, that's one thing. But if you're 14 and then you move into the fiction that's geared for an older audience, that's not the best. Right. Yeah, so, and I... I mean, they are romance novels. Sex happens in them. Um, you know. I mean, sure. Sex but. happens in your other books, too. Yes. Um, <laughs> this is definitely geared, this definitely has a heavier romance element. Yeah, this very much is about the two people. Um, one of the main characters, Marie, we've talked about, but the other main character um, is a lord named um, Blaise Clavre which is my modification of the name Bisclare, which is a name of one of the lays, the romances from Marie de France about a guy that turns into a wolf three days a week. Um, huh. And so that's where I got that character and he turns into a wolf three days a week. Um, he can't stop it. It's not lunar at all. And he does stay in his right mind when he's a wolf. He's as much a, a guy in brain when he's a wolf as he is when he's a man. Um, and it's thought that actually Marie de France is the first person to write that in England. Uh, something that when they turn into a wolf, they maintain their humanity. 
So it's kind of an interesting story for that reason. Um, but interestingly, he also has a failed marriage because when his wife found out about this, she was not thrilled. Um, so that's oh, sort of how the backstories came out of both. Um, and Marie has a pet ferret, Asta, that also comes out of one of the stories. Um, it that. comes out of the same story from her backstory. So there are a lot of little things in there. And if you know medieval romance, I think you'll get them. If not, it doesn't matter. Yeah, um, because I didn't get, I don't know bupkis about medieval romance. And I got, I got the book. Yeah, I mean, if you know anything about pop culture knights and ladies and stuff, it's enough to know. Yeah, I mean, but if you've seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you're good. Monty Python and the Holy Grail is actually remarkably accurate and pretty well researched. <laughs> Just because it's making fun of it doesn't mean it isn't true. <laughs> I am not surprised because those Yeah, guys, I mean, they all are, what, was it Oxford that they all came out of? I was just going to say brilliant, but yeah. Yeah. So cool. So people can buy the book right now. Where yeah. can they find out more about you other than linking to your books on the Falstaff Books website? Um, my webpage, emilylavinleverett.com, has stuff about all my writing, and it also does mention my scholarship and um, the editorial work. I just put out a collection of short stories called Predators in Petticoats with a friend of mine, Margaret McGraw, and right. John has a story in it. Yes, um, that's, it's, a, it's, um, that's a Lila Grace story. That's from yes. my Amazing Grace universe. Yeah, and it's a beautiful story. But they're all stories about uh, women predators of one kind or another. Um, so yeah, Emily emilylavinleverett.com, no spaces, no dots. Um, I also have a newsletter that you can sign up for there. And if you do, you'll get the short story, The Lady, which is in the Ice Squad Chronicles universe. Um, and so it's about a vampire. There are vampires in the Ice Squad Chronicles. Um, so there is that. And I may be at convention. I will be at the <laughs> online Con Carolina stuff. Um, if it happens, I'll be at Multiverse next year. Um, but who yeah. knows for now with those. Who knows when we'll be back at conventions. But until then, this has been Storytellers. And thank you guys for watching. All of those links that Emily just mentioned will be below in the show notes. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share, and ring the little bell to get notified whenever we have new content, because Melissa, my associate publisher, wants me to mention that in every video, because it makes her happy when people ring the bell. I don't know how she knows. I don't know if she's watching you. But stuff like that's the reason I put a sticky note over the webcam on my computer when I'm not running these tapings. <laughs> so thank you, Emily. And until next time, y'all take care of each other, okay? <laughs>